This book, ACTS, Acknowledging Christ the Savior, written by Tony Brooke Brown. This book is dedicated to the one who saved me, changed me, healed me, delivered me. I dedicate this book to the one who loved me when I was unlovable, found me when I was lost, was there when others left, picked me up when I was down, took me out of darkness, and brought me into his marvelous light. I dedicate this book to the one I serve. I dedicate this book to the one who inspired and directed me to write these words of truth. There is none other and there is none greater. God, my Father, Creator, Sustainer, Lord, Master, and King. Acts, the Introduction. This book is a challenge for the body of Christ to examine ourselves. This writing is a word for the church with scripture to back up every accusation, statement, and word of instruction for the church as we know it today. These pages that you are about to hear will confront the issues of the church, not the buildings, but the people. It is controversial in that people have become numb to the truth and have turned away from sound doctrine. If the word of God still has effect on believers, then this book will cause a self-examination for the readers because it is the word of God taught, shared, and reiterated, repeated, gone over, and reinstated. These scriptures are for the pastor, preacher, teacher, evangelist, apostle, bishop, minister, choir member, usher, Sunday school teacher, intercessor, deacon, deaconess, pew sitter, church secretary, outreach worker, ministry head, and ministry worker. No matter what level you serve, or if you are simply an every now and then church attendee, this word will speak to you if you're open to receive. If the expectation of the reader is not to look to be offended, but to expect to be enriched, then the experience should enlighten and cause a new sense of responsibility, boldness, and commitment. On the contrary, a believer who has no desire to be accountable to God will not be convicted, but offended, insulted, hurt, and upset. The scripture tells us in John chapter 6, verses 60 through 61 and 66, Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Lukewarm is what the church as a whole has become. Yes, it is true, and it will be shown and proven in this audio book. Not with the words of people, but according to the word of God. We are told in the book of Revelation that the lukewarm will be spit out. What is the proof that we have become a lukewarm church, a stiff-necked people, a social group of folks with an agenda of our own? The word is the proof, the evidence. The Bible tells us we are called to be what we're called to do and also educates us about the ways that are contrary to the call, including false teachings and hypocritical lifestyles. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33 in the New International Version, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. This same verse of scripture in Matthew 10 and 32 from the King James Version reads, whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. The Greek word for acknowledge or confess is spelled H-O-M-O-L-O-G-E-O. This word properly means to voice the same conclusion, to agree with, to profess, because in full agreement, to align with, to endorse, to be of one mind, to speak the same thing, to declare, and to admit. Jesus lets us know that whoever acknowledges him, agrees with him, speaks the same thing as he speaks, 
publicly declares and praises him before others, will be in agreement with him before his father. To live for him now is to live for him and with him forever. This sounds simple enough. It appears to be an uncomplicated request with benefits, eternal life, and hope for a future if we simply are not ashamed, afraid, or hesitant to agree with Christ in our actions, thoughts, and words. What does this require? How is this accomplished? Is it at all possible? Is this what our church is doing today as a whole? And lastly, does it really matter? Acts chapter 1. Comparing the church of today with the church of Acts, the early church, we find quite a contrast. The boldness of the church of Acts, the commitment level, the willingness and desire, the zeal and zest, the determination and fortitude, the focus and motivation, the sacrifices and surrender that we see in the book of Acts is not what we experience in the church of today. The compromise in the church of today hinders the power that was present in the early church of Acts. What they show us as a move of the Holy Spirit is not what we describe as the move of the Holy Spirit today. The work of the church was sharing the gospel daily in the temple and from house to house. The scriptures read in Acts chapter 5 verses 40 through 42 in the King James Version, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. There did not seem to be a great focus on programs, but a focus on souls. There wasn't talk about people getting rich and having designer clothes, the biggest house, or finest ride. In fact, the word says in Acts 4 verses 33 through 35 in the NIV, it reads, with great power, the apostles continue to stay testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them for, for from time to time those who owned land or houses sold them brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Again, this is Acts 4, 33 through 35, the NIV. Does this make a difference? Yes, this makes the difference between preaching about the power of relationship with the giver of the gift of life, as opposed to preaching a powerless message about seeking more gifts in this life. It is clearly the difference between preaching about the temporal versus the eternal, the carnal versus spiritual, a lie versus the truth. This is why the church of today does not have the power displayed in the early church described in the book of Acts. The focus in the book of Acts is the number added to the body as a whole, not the size of a congregation on every block. The motivation in the book of Acts focuses on unity, not competition. There were no denominations causing separation. There was no marketing department for the churches or PR people for the preachers. There were no bodyguards and no annual days, no women's days and no men's days. The word speaks of the gospel being preached, repentance and baptism. The Bible speaks of signs and wonders demons cast out, and people being healed. Where are the churches where the people of God will pray and fast so they can cast out demons? Churches will have a month where there is a focus on something like black history, but not have a month committed to witnessing in the street. Churches will have marketing meetings deciding the best way to bring in revenue. And the answer is to bring in people. So people become a means for revenue so the church preaches messages that sound good so people will come and not leave. The choir becomes the move of the Holy Spirit so if people rise to their feet and kept, can't stop singing, we say the Spirit was moving in service today. 
But what about those who came bound by addictions and fear, abuse, and generational curses? What about those living lifestyles of fornication, adultery, same-sex relationships? What about those who are grieving and missing? Those who are broken through divorce or abandonment? Why does the church notice the big tithers are missing from attendance, but not the homeless man that came the last two weeks, but was absent this Sunday? Where is the church where Christ is the head? The truth is this, church has become a business, the best programs in buildings, the best dressed and most popular. This is how ministry is measured in the church of today. It is amazing to read of the sharing in the church as it was described in the book of Acts. It is awesome to think that people cared enough about one another that they would sell what they had in order to share with someone in need. Where is that church? It seems that the church today is teaching us how we can get more and more of what we want, lay hands on things we desire, but not teaching us to lay hands on the sick. It is sad to think that we have exchanged holy living for church clubs. A club is merely an association, a social establishment, a place for social gatherings that plays the latest music and encourages dancing. We are uptight about the dress code, but not about the state of the heart. We want people to dress nice and look good on the outside, but don't care to hear about their hurt on the inside. Church will put a person out when they come in homeless and dirty, addicted and broken because they don't want to get robbed. They don't want the church to look bad. However, we will allow people to come in with filthy hearts, ungodly motives, abusive spirits, and pride as long as they look good on the outside and put their ties in the envelope. What church is this and who is the head of it? We speak of the power of the Holy Spirit. We talk about the anointing upon men and women of God. What determines this anointing? In the book of Acts, we read in Acts 1 and 8 in the King James Version, but you shall receive power after that, that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The power of the Holy Ghost is to give us power to be witnesses. So we are not only speaking of the choir singing a song while someone runs down an aisle. We're speaking of lives changed to the point of surrender and submission. We're talking about a power that enables us to be witnesses by living godly lives, sharing the gospel with boldness and sharing the love of God. We're not talking about a power that we have where we lay hands on a car we want, but a power where we lay hands on the sick. We're not speaking of a power where we stand up and preach about prosperity, but a power where we cast out demons in Jesus name. We're not speaking of a power where we think we are somebody special that people should look up to and praise, but we are reading about a power where we are, we re glorify God by being a light, sharing his love, giving his word and abiding in his son. This is the power written about. In Acts 1 and 8. Today's church has gotten confused, become mixed up, and we have lost our focus. How do we know that we have lost our way? Look around. I remember in the book of Acts chapter 12, Peter was wrongfully in prison. He was scheduled to die. He had done nothing wrong, and he was bound and guarded. Did the church protest, shut down the streets? Stop shopping at all the stores, etc. No, the Bible says in Acts 12 and 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but the prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. If you're not familiar with this story, if you've not read this chapter, if you've forgotten this principle, the church knew that the battle was not against flesh and blood. It was not carnal and neither were their weapons carnal. The church knew this was a spiritual battle which required the use of spiritual weapons. They prayed without ceasing. They were together on one accord. They continued before God and God sent an angel to release Peter. This is important because God received the glory, not man. It wasn't because the people fought for his release in the natural. It was proof that God is a miracle working chain-breaking deliverer. 
Have we forgotten that the battle is the Lord's? I believe it breaks God's heart to see that we trust more in our strength and power than in his miracle working power. I believe that it grieves him at his heart when we do what is right in our own eyes instead of what he instructed us in his word. The Bible reads in 2 Corinthians 10 and 4 in the King James Version, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I believe that we have forgotten that we are in a spiritual battle, not a carnal war. We have forgotten that we are called as soldiers on the battlefield instead of pew sitters inside of the walls of a church building. The scriptures read in 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4 in the King James Version, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. It's not about us being seen as starting a movement. The church was not seen when they were praying for Peter. They were in a house. They were in secret. They were before God. The scriptures tell us in Matthew 6 and 6, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. It is not all right. It is not all inclusive. We are called to be vessels and instruments for righteousness. We will fight for race, for money, for secular rights. But what about fighting for the kingdom of God? We will come together with unbelievers and those who follow other gods saying that we are all fighting for the same thing. Lies. We're not fighting for the same things and we are fighting the wrong way. The church is set apart. We fight spiritual warfare with spiritual weapons alongside Bible-believing, word-walking, spirit-led people. You see, every wrong in our families, cities, states, nations, and the world is a sin problem, a spiritual issue, and a spiritual battle. The answer is Christ. The deliverer is God. The solution is the word. The battle is not ours. We are doing it wrong. Have we forgotten who we are? Have we forgotten our position, calling, and stance? Have we begun to blend in with the world so much that people cannot tell us from the world? They can't tell who's representing the church and who's standing on behalf of the world? Is the church becoming so politically correct that we're walking spiritually weak? Has the church forgotten how fanatical and radical the first church was? How spirit-filled they were? How bold they preached? How selfless their prayers were? How they were willing to suffer so some could live? Have we forgotten who we are called to be? What we were empowered to do? Who we were instructed to follow? Are we acknowledging Christ the Savior do we recognize his authority? Are we accepting his position and power? Are we submitted to his truth? And does our life show that we are truly living for him? Acknowledging Christ is a lifestyle, not a Sunday morning event. It's amazing as we read and study the book of Acts, there is persecution, beatings, imprisonment, and accusations. But the word never ceased to go forth. There were attacks on the apostles, but they would not stop preaching. There were threats, but they would not stop teaching. There were painful beatings, but they would not stop witnessing. In fact, they rejoiced. Acts 5 verse 41 in the King James Version reads, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. In the church of today, we are mad if someone parks in our parking space. We don't want anyone to sit in our seat. People feel neglected if the pastor does not speak and the pastor is offended if he or she isn't recognized as someone special. How would we ever stand in the day of persecution and suffering for Christ's sake? 
The church has become lazy and pampered so that there's no real need for persecuting the church in America. In fact, when the unsaved, bound, and broken are seen on our way to church, we pass them by. Just as the priest and the Levite did when they saw the man on the side of the road, they were representing God but would not help the hurting. This is a picture of the church. Too dressed up to give a ride to the homeless, too holy to help the unsaved, too proper to reach out to the hungry. Well, if, unless, of course, it's a Christmas time uh, event. At Christmas time, some will help out the homeless shelters as long as it's not on Christmas Day. Some will help those in need and share the gospel at Christmas time. It almost seems that the church believes that if a person has a Christmas present, they're okay for the rest of the year. Christmas was not celebrated in the Bible, so perhaps that made people more conscious of the need for salvation instead of a tree. Maybe that caused the church to realize that people need Christ and love every day. Perhaps it would keep us more focused on the kingdom of God if we were not so focused on man-made celebrations and traditions. These apostles suffered not because of sin that they had committed, but because they were preaching the gospel. They were beaten not because they committed a crime, but because they were casting out demons. Does the church of today make such a public stand that the communities are intimidated, upset, or unsettled? No. We will march for rights, but not for Christ. We will speak out on a race, but not religion. We will protest with the world about worldly things, but not with the church exclusively as it relates to Christ. The church of today is not to be compared to the church we read about in the book of Acts. Suffering for today's church seems to be when we have to shovel our driveway to get to church service. Suffering for today's church is when we have to park two streets away and then walk without a shuttle bus. Suffering for today's church seems to be when we are not recognized for a program, saluted for our song, praised for our preaching, acknowledged for our ties, chosen for leadership, selected for the lead song, or when our name is not listed on the program when we assisted in the planning. Suffering for today's church is based on our ego when suffering in the book of Acts was for God's glory and for the name of Jesus. Suffering for today's church is not suffering at all. If you live in the United States, not yet anyway. You see, the problem is this. Persecution is coming and we are not ready. There will be a time coming when we will be required to either suffer for our faith or convert to another. Are we ready? No, we are not. The church of today may have teachers with uh, degrees and the ability to teach Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, but the church of today lacks power that comes from the willingness to suffer, the power that comes from denying self and living for Christ. The church of today lacks the power of the anointing that was present in the church recorded in Acts. Until we learn to deny self, we will only suffer so much we will limit our commitment and we will be less effective in our witness. We have been called to suffer. Jesus said the world would hate us. Matthew 13 and 13 in the KJV, he says, and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. So for some churches of today, there's more emphasis placed on speaking in tongues than speaking God's word. And this should not B. You see, in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 in the KJV, it says, Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. When we have charity, which means love, it compels us to preach the gospel. When we have charity, which means love, we care about people's soul more than focusing on a gift. Does the church of today care about souls enough to suffer in order for people to hear? Do we preach to every creature as instructed? Is today's church sold out for the gospel? Will you suffer for Christ's sake? Paul noted his sufferings without complaint. He went through persecution and pain that the church today knows nothing about. The churches in the United States speak of the church being attacked, but does nothing about it. 
The more Paul was persecuted, the more he realized the power of Christ. Paul speaks in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 31 in the King James Version. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. We claim to be attacked by the enemy when we disagree in a meeting. More time is spent in meetings at the church of today about fundraisers, teas, the color of choir robes, color of suits for leaders, etc. than time spent outside of the walls preaching the gospel. Is this the church Christ died for or is it the church? man created. If there is no persecution, then there is no truth being shared. The church of today preaches that we are blessed if we have money, cars, and big houses, because God wants us to have the best of everything. The Bible does not read in this manner unless we are teaching the man version. This is what the King James Version says, or in fact, this is what Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In Luke 12, verse 15, and he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetedness, for a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Jesus' teachings do not suggest that material wealth is the measuring tool for being blessed, but he seems to tell us that we are blessed when we are persecuted for righteousness. According to the Merriam, Merriam Webster Dictionary, persecute means to cause to suffer because of belief. To persecute. In one Greek definition, literally referring to those seeking to punish God's messengers with a vengeance, like a hunter trying to conquer, obliterate someone as their catch. Do we believe that the apostles consider themselves blessed when persecuted or punished for righteousness sake? Well, let's look at Paul and Silas in Acts 16 as they went to prayer. The Bible goes on to tell us that Paul and Silas's clothes were rent off and they were beaten. After the beating, they were thrown into prison and they had their feet locked in stocks. This is what it means to suffer for Christ's sake. After being persecuted for righteousness, what was the response from these men of God? What did they say? How did they react? And how did they feel? The Bible says in Acts 16 and 25 in the King James Version, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Would this be the reaction of the church of today? Would there be praising in the prison, praying in the midnight hour? Or would we hear weeping and complaining, whining and murmuring? After all, we must remember that these men were not only put in the inner prison, but they were unclothed and beaten, which gives a visual of blood, open wounds, scars, and bumps. We get a visual of men that were hurting, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. But they were still praying and praising God. You see, it was the praising and praying that caused their freedom because the Bible says in Acts 16 and 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. The power of prayer and praise. Do we understand it? Do we understand that persecution is a blessing if we endure 
Sure, the flesh desires to fight back in a kernel way with kernel weapons, but this is not God's way. We must remember that the call on our life is to surrender, and we must be willing to suffer if necessary without restriction or hesitation. The endurance of Paul and Silas gave freedom to them as well as those who were with them. If we learn to suffer well through trials and trouble, we will have peace in the storm and victory in the end. It is about winning souls to Christ. You see, after the prayer praise concert of Paul and Silas, after the prison doors opened and the jailer awakened, his question was, what must I do to be saved? This is the end of chapter one of Acts, acknowledging Christ the Savior.